60 Minutes Rewind. Molly Safer, who was the first American television newsman to report from communist China, has just returned from the China of Chiang Kai-shek. For two decades since his defeat on the mainland, it was the policy of the United States to practice and propagate the idea that Chiang's island of Taiwan was the one and only China. There was a Mad Hatter's kind of logic about it all. Supporting Chiang's pronouncements that his forces of so-called free China would invade the mainland, at the same time carefully ensuring that he would not, while at the same time containing communist China with a nuclear threat, and at the same time not recognizing its existence. And so for generations now, our China policy has been anchored to our commitment to Chiang. For years in the United States, a barrage of propaganda portrayed Chiang and his regime both before and after his defeat on the mainland as the democratic leader of free China, denying that the struggle in China between Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong was a naked struggle for power between two ruthless men, both bent on imposing their own personal dictatorship over millions of Chinese people. So on Taiwan, the myth of a Republican China was perpetuated, and Chiang and Madame Chiang were pictured as the aging Kennedys of a Camelot that never was. Little has disturbed the calm of their Taiwan exile over the past 20 years. American assurances of protecting and nurturing the so-called Republic of China guaranteed at least the Generalissimo's position as the leader of a mini-China. U.S. policy of not recognizing the mainland reinforced Chang's dream of a return. But last week, reality intruded in the bizarre form of a ping-pong competition. The old man is now 84. He is fit and in full control, according to his advisors. As we walked in his garden, there was nothing to indicate otherwise. And after a decade of almost gullist inaccessibility, the Generalissimo submitted to a television interview. Chang refused to give a spontaneous interview. He would only agree to give his views if questions were submitted in advance. No follow-up questions permitted. His policy, he says, has not changed in 40 years. And he proudly states it will never change. Mr. President, with regard to the ping-pong visits to communist China by the United States, does the do you regard this change in policy between the United States and communist China as a direct threat to the Republic of China? Mm. The Chinese Communist invitation and the visit of the American table tennis team to the Chinese mainland are merely new approaches to the international united front intrigues of the Peiping regime. Such Chinese communist tactics of external infiltration and subversion have borne their first fruit. If all of us are aware of this, I think there should be no substantial change in the relationships between the United States and the Chinese communists. The cheating of Beiping were fair, as the deceit is recognized. The fundamental foreign policy of the Republic of China is based on belief that in statecraft, the nation should rely not on others, but itself. No change in external elements or factors will affect the position of the Republic of China or alter its fundamental national policy. Neither the Chinese version of communism on the mainland nor the Chinese version of Western democracy here in Taiwan has very much changed the nature of the Chinese people. Both are alien ideas adopted out of necessity by the people of the Middle Kingdom. And when you look at both Chinas, you get the feeling that the similarities between the two are much stronger than the differences that keep them apart. What has been called the cultural unity of the Chinese people dominates life both in Peking and Taiwan and among Chinese people on the other side of the earth. The same rich street life, the same gregarious nature, the same pride and arrogance, 
the same respect for the fundamental importance of education, the same sense of being Chinese, and the same understanding that Americans and other foreigners, no matter how inscrutable and alien they may be, must be dealt with. Chang and his army and his Kuomintang party found the mainland ungovernable, but Taiwan under the umbrella of American security was a tight little island, rich with the heritage of China's great past, but relatively free of the dissensions that have torn it apart through the centuries. The old relationship between man and soil is there. No fear of famine on Taiwan. The struggle here is not political. It is the old cycle of China, man and earth and water. And for him, it is not all that different 120 miles away. Nature has created its own bondage on the Chinese people, and neither Chang's nor Mao's version of liberty has even challenged it. But both Chinas have learned to feed themselves, that alone, a great leap forward. Taiwan is not so ideologically regimented as the mainland, but you wonder just how deeply embedded communism is over there. In its long history, China has gone through periodic convulsions of self-assertion. And the result, in both Chinas and in Chinese communities overseas, has been a way of life, a philosophy, a culture, even a diet that is unique. Taipei is not drenched in the thought of President Chang. But to a foreigner's eye, the red banners that hang in every street, that front every shop, give it the look of Peking. They are slogans, too all with a strong moral tone. Do not spit. Be polite on the telephone. Do not beat your wife. Cleanliness is next to godliness, that sort of thing. Slogans and homilies in the streets of China predate both Mao and Chang. The 22 years of exile have been fruitful ones for the people of Chang. There is no question that the 14 million people of Taiwan, to put it in its simplest terms, are better off than the 700 million on the mainland. Simple arithmetic has a lot to do with it, and so has the energy and inventiveness of the people themselves. China on Taiwan has leaped into the 20th century. Its own natural vigor, urged on by the two biggest industrial giants at either end of the globe, Japan and the United States. For reasons of profit and geopolitics, firms like Toyota and Philips, Ford and Sony, Mitsubishi and IBM have poured billions into industrializing Taiwan, to the point that the tiny island's gross national product almost equals that of the communist mainland, and its exports are even greater. Japanese and American business supports Taiwan for more than ideological reasons. Example, the Tatung Company of Taipei makes and assembles computer components. Their main customer is the International Business Machine Company. The girls on the assembly line in Taipei, all high school graduates, earn $50 a month, a very good salary in Taiwan. So long as outside production costs are high and Taiwanese production costs are low, Chang's China will continue to prosper. But with China's great grab at the 20th century, they've carried with them the deeply rooted culture of the 10th. In the mornings in Taipei, just as in Shanghai and Nanking, the men rise early and gather in public places for the ancient art of shadow boxing. It is part exercise, part dance, as spiritual as it is physical. Totally at odds with the sweaty Anglo-Saxon version of keeping in shape, but at least as manly. In Taiwan, they claim to be the repository of China's cultural tradition that the communists have rejected the richness of the past. Some validity to it, perhaps, during the wild excesses of the Cultural Revolution. But even then, when I was in Mao's China, I found that centuries of tradition could not be erased by any Marxist-Maoist doctrine, not in a country where individual old age is revered as scholarly wisdom, which perhaps explains why both Chairman Mao and Generalissimo Chang have both held power for so long. Of all the virtues, the Chinese place most value on education. In Taiwan, history classes stress the great cultural superiority of China 
in the 11th century, while most of Europe fumbled through the darkness of the Middle Ages. On the mainland, I watched a similar class discuss the same subject, the Song Dynasty. But the stress was on the talent of the great proletarian masses, whose artistry flowered, the teachers proclaimed, despite the despotism of the landlords. In Taiwan, they gloss over the history of the past 25 years. Even so, there is great pride in the modern achievements of the Chinese people, no matter where they were made, mixed with a certain bitterness when they are made on the mainland. Of course, there is a common pride, you see, in Chinese. The pride of what? The pride of their, uh, the, 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 the culture of their forebearers. It's not a pride of just being a Chinese, uh, whether he's educated or uneducated, he's very pride. No, there isn't such a thing. The pride is only of our culture and civilization. That is something we are proud of. James Wei runs the government's information office for Taiwan. He escaped the mainland along with Chang and his army 22 years ago. He now helps to sell Taiwan's image abroad. Don't you tell me that Mao Zedong is respected by by the, by the other world, by the other countries. No, he's despised upon. But since he claimed to have this nuclear weapon and 700 million, actually he has 700 million enemies, you see. And then, you see, he boosts him up like a big fellow. He's not. He, uh, the more he claimed of the, civil, uh, the population on the mainland, the more he, he has the enemy. <laughs> so to us, so we, 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 we deeply uh, confident of that. But isn't the dream of regaining the mainland really just a pipe dream in the realities of the 70s? Uh, you see, uh, uh, this word, uh, uh, dream, uh, uh, we, we, we definitely uh, we know that uh, uh, we'll be successful because it's no dream. It's very real. It's very, very real because the Chinese people on the main, they don't like the kind of a life they are leading now under the leadership or under the, 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 the rule of, uh, of uh, the communists. It is a military that dominates that uh, uh, whole mainland of China now. Yes, it's undeniable. The story will continue after this. The military has dominated Taiwan as well, ever since the day the Republic was formed here in 1949. It was a defeated army led by a defeated general that set up shop in what was Formosa 22 years ago. And each morning, the Chinese version of the Pentagon marches in columns of two into the presidential office building. Both Chinas, ideology apart, are military bureaucracies. The defeated army of Chang had been trained and equipped by the United States. And for two decades now, it has been part of American China policy to continue to train and equip the half million man army. It was the repeated promise of the Generalissimo that the Republic would be returned through force of arms. It did not concern his American advisors for Chang's reputation as a general indicated more expertise in tactical withdrawal than in audacious attack. And to ensure that his army would stay put, U.S. military aid to Taiwan was sufficient to give it the trappings of a modern force, but not nearly enough to launch a major offensive. The aircraft are post-Korea, but pre-Vietnam. Big war does seem remote, as the United States and Communist China take the first tentative steps towards each other. But a small pea shooter war has gone on for years between Taiwan and the mainland. The pride of General Chang's army, shown off to all visitors, the frogmen. From time to time, they slip into the mainland, blow up some railway tracks, scatter some propaganda, and return. And the mainland replies with their frogmen. So the myth of the continued struggle by both sides has a slim shred of reality.
They do it, of course, with a little less song, but both armies like to take to the water to celebrate the glories of the chairman's thought or the splendor of Chinese history or chorus the death blow to come to the gangster regime in Peking or Taipei. Songs of the struggles of another time. And for Chiang Kai-shek, nothing will change his belief that he represents the true aspirations of all of China. The smiling campaign adopted by the Chinese communists in the recent months is, in the president's opinion, only a tactical maneuver. The basic aims of the Chinese communists have not changed and will not change. The president sincerely hopes that the governments and peoples of the free nations will face the facts squarely and not permit themselves to be caught in the pitfall of the Chinese communist peaceful offensive. Do you hold hope, sir, that the Republic of China will be able to restore itself on the mainland? Due to the perpetuity of the Chinese culture as well as history, I have full confidence that the Chinese mainland shall be and will be recovered. My confidence has never wavered a bit. Nevertheless, does it, do you feel, sir, that the United States will ultimately recognize communist China? I'm not in a position to answer this question for the United States government. From my experience of association and cooperation with the government and people of the United States, retaining from my four decades of public life, however, I'm convinced that the American government and people will certainly make wise decision and judgment that are incommensurate with their own security and long-term interests. You've had decades of very close personal relationship with the United States. In view of these new developments, do you feel that the United States has let you down or stabbed China in the back? Traditional Chinese philosophy teaches us that in dealing with friends, we should be loyal and faithful. In all of our relations with friendly nations, we have been strictly adhering to these principles of loyalty and faithfulness. Of course, we expect friends to do the same to us. A relationship with communist China does not mean that Chang's friends have abandoned him. But it could mean that they have begun to separate reality from illusion. In 40 years, Chang's friends did all they could for him. It was time, that traditional ally of China, that let him down. Chang refused to answer any questions about the possibility of coming to terms with communist China. If he has been anything in his long life, he has been consistent. <laughs>